Okay, this episode is going to be quite heavy. Europe looked a lot different by the 1950s than it did before the Second World War, and not just because of the redrawn borders. The war was full of the mass movements of refugees across the continent, and it caused a lot of chaos, suffering, and many, many deaths. Today, we're going back a little bit in our chronology to look specifically at the experiences of ethnic Germans and the mass movement of them to what would become East and West Germany. I'm your host, David, and this is The Cold War. To begin, we're going to need to understand that the idea of nations is always going to be a tough thing in Central and Eastern Europe. Before the wars of German unification, it looked like this mess of small states, principalities, and the like. This meant that once Germany claimed this area after the unification, it was a stew of various ethnicities blended together in now a big pot. It wasn't always sunshine and flowers, but these ethnicities interacted more or less with each other all the time. But then, somewhere along the way, nationalism became a much bigger thing. Ethnicities decided that intermixing with others was no longer a good idea, as they were hopped up on an ethnic supremacy and making territorial claims. So what's a young German empire to do? Well, to keep the fighting down, they decided to take different ethnicities and put them in different regions. This was the first big project of mass movements of people. It was about as messy as you'd expect. Then, after the First World War, several new states were carved onto the map through the Versailles Treaties. New countries, such as Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, and Yugoslavia, appeared. In spite of attempts to draw borders along ethnic lines, the region was still very diverse. So these new nations contained many ethnicities, including many ethnic Germans. And of course, we cannot forget about the many ethnic Germans that had been living further east in what was now the Soviet Union. In the rise of Nazi Germany, a hypernationalist state, the government in Berlin used these German ethnic minorities in Eastern Europe as an excuse to begin a path of conquest across Europe. During that occupation, some ethnic Germans used this nationalist government to climb to positions of power in their occupied countries. As the Nazis began to lose the war, many of these countries decided to expel all the ethnic Germans they could from their borders. As the Red Army began to push the Germans back in Eastern Europe, Germans in Eastern Europe began to get nervous. Rumors had already gotten to them on how Soviet troops dealt with German civilians. They heard stories of rape, murder, and pillaging, which the Nazi government spread to bolster support for the war effort. Now, even though some planning occurred to evacuate Germans in the path of the advancing Red Army, it never really happened. In fact, the Nazi order of no retreat likely put more people in danger. Germans had to leave Eastern Europe of their own accord, eventually resulting in entire communities organizing exoduses, exodi, whatever the plural of exodus is. This would result in lines of refugees which would span for kilometers as Germans took everything they owned and began to flee for Germany, a site which would be seen a lot of in the years to come. Some of these people on the Baltic coast got on boats and wound up in Denmark, where they'd stay in internment camps. After the war, many Germans in Central and Eastern Europe were now under Soviet occupation. In the Potsdam Agreement, the Allied powers agreed to receive ethnic Germans, as Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland planned to expel every single one of them from their borders. If you recall from our early episodes on the Potsdam Agreement, the border of the Soviet Union had moved west into Polish territory, and the western border of Poland had been moved further west as compensation. This meant that Germans, who had been living in Germany, now found themselves living in Poland, and then being forced to leave. Yugoslavia put their Germans in internment camps, where tens of thousands of them died in brutal conditions. In all countries, they lost most of their personal belongings and created a massive refugee crisis. This also occurred in some Western European countries, like the Netherlands, which expelled over 20,000 of their ethnic German population as well. In Poland, the USSR deported many Germans, but not towards the West, but to the East, to the Soviet Union, 
to work in forced labor camps as a form of reparation. Few in Poland had much sympathy because the German Empire had expelled tons of ethnic Poles. Atrocities piled up over atrocities, which I guess is part and parcel for the Second World War. Of those sent to the labor camps, nearly half of them died. So why would they do what would basically be one of the most extensive programs of ethnic cleansing in history? Well, there were several reasons they gave for such a brutal expulsion of people. The first reason we already mentioned, nationalism. One might think the world would have gotten over the idea after the Second World War. Still, instead of going away, like eugenics, into the dustbin of bad ideas, it stuck around. It evolved into the nation-state. The nation-state being the concept that every state should contain one homogenous ethnic group. Instead of acknowledging that Central and Eastern Europe were diverse places, they decided it was better to forcibly move people into whatever border was drawn on the map for people that look and talk like them. Even in the communist world, where nationalism was supposed to be a thing of the past, they discussed moving Poles and Ukrainians into their correct borders. Stalin liked the idea of German expulsion because the anger generated in Germany might make a new communist satellite state in Eastern Europe stay close with the USSR in fear of reprisal. The second reason was that many countries saw Germans as a potential threat which could undermine their country from within, a supposed fifth column. They suspected Germans wouldn't be loyal to these new nation states and that they'd possibly help cause yet another world war. Feeding on both ideas, many allies in the West justified this mass expulsion of Germans as necessary for stability. They thought ethnic-based violence would break out if they kept German minorities in Central and Eastern Europe. Some also saw this as a perfectly justifiable collective punishment for Germany starting the Second World War. The brutality of the German occupations of Europe, the war crimes, the Holocaust, the horrors we should not subtract from the Nazi regime, gave many animus to want to expel every last person of German heritage. As these refugees arrived in Germany, no one was prepared to handle the sheer load of so many people. In a seeming case of deja vu, trains arrived filled with corpses and extremely ill or starving people. Germans this time. Many had been brutally beaten, raped, or murdered as part of their voyage out of their respective countries under Soviet occupation. Families were scattered, and many had already spent significant time in internment camps before being sent to refugee camps in Germany. And it's not like Germany was in such a great position itself. It had been devastated by the war, the economy would be ruined for years, and there was a critical shortage of housing a shortage which would last until the 1960s. The French, who you will recall had been given a zone of occupation but didn't sign the Potsdam Agreement, refused to help the refugees who wound up in their zone at all. Though the French absorbed many of those refugees who were interned in Denmark where they were dying at a shockingly high rate. The Soviets, who were facilitating most of the expulsions, offered little in aid to those who arrived in Germany forcing the British and the US occupation zones to pick up the slack. Immediately, there were supply issues. Most of the Allies were economically depleted themselves, the result of just fighting the Second World War. The importation of mass amounts of supplies, like food and coal, was an expensive endeavor if there was even food to buy. Overall, the process of expulsion and the refugee crisis resulted in the deaths of about 2 to 3 million people. That's about 4% of the entire losses of the Second World War. The expulsions also left many children orphaned in various corners of Europe. In some places, they lived as homeless kids, sometimes resorting to scratching living in the forests. In the former East Prussia, stories of these wolf children wouldn't become public until the end of communism. As many as 14 million Germans were displaced by this period of post-war history. It's the single largest movement of any ethnic group in the history of Europe, but still only part of the 30 million people displaced in the larger European theater of war. Many international laws put in place since the end of the war, especially those relating to ethnic cleansing, would make such an event today illegal 
but yet we still see the mass expulsions occur and a collective failure to help the victims of them. As Europe experienced a refugee crisis only a few years ago, Germany stood out as a stout defender of the rights of the refugee. Maybe this story will give you a little clue as to why. Mass expulsions and forced movements of people are not as neutral and bloodless as they sound. These are brutal events. Throughout history, you might hear of removing people or forced migration, and their stories are nearly always a dark one. So when you listen to the stories in the world of mass movements of people, desperate going to extreme lengths to escape war, famine, crime, or ethnic cleansing, please think of this story of the refugee. We hope you may have taken something away from today's topic. My thanks to Tristan from Step Back History for tackling the research and writing for a very difficult topic. We do plan a future episode covering some of the other ethnic expulsions that occurred in the wake of the Second World War. So in order not to miss this and more, please make sure you're subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. We're also active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar or via YouTube membership. This is The Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with The Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.